Um, hello, my name is Ben Wyman and I'm the manager for the Centre for Fashion Curation and welcome to this evening's event. It's titled Fashion and Curating, Debating the Disciplines. And uh, this uh, research centre was recently formed at uh, the LCF. And I work alongside Laura Thornley, who's actually very busy helping get the final people in. And we pull together uh, a series of programmes of exhibitions, events and publications. And uh, we also work with Polona Dolzon, who's also helping to get the last few people in. And um, she works with Ligaya Salazar and Alison Maloney in their work in the gallery and in the international programme. I'm very pleased to introduce you to the people who are taking part in the panel tonight. They're all members of the centre, except for our chair, who I'll introduce you to separately in a minute. And they all contribute to the expertise on offer. I'm going to be very brief because, um, Amy, if you wouldn't mind just turning to the, um, where you can find out all the information about the people on the panel. Uh, the UAL Research Centre, um, Centre for Fashion Curation page. You can go uh, straight to the site, uh, the UAL uh, site, and there's a research tab that you can click on, and you should be able to find the center there. If you can't find that, um, then you can just uh, search it on an internet search engine. Or, and also, there's a separate page, the UAL research staff page, and that has uh, separate individual biographies of each of our panel members. Tonight, I'm just going to very briefly introduce you to the titles of each of the people on the panel. Uh, first, uh, we're very lucky to have two directors of the center. The first is Amy Delahaye, right at the end there, if you don't know her already. And she is Professor and Ruth Dean Hopkins Chair of Dress, History and Curatorship. We have our Chair, Carol Tullock, next. I'm going to talk about you in a second, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Judith Clark, next to Carol, is Professor of Fashion and Museology. The other center and panel members are we have Alison Maloney, and she is a curator of the international programs. We have Jane Holt, and she's a senior research fellow for the archives. We then have Dr. Sean Cole, who is a program leader at LCF for the Culture and Curation Program, and that includes the MA in Fashion and Curation. And we also have Claire Wilcox, she is Professor of Fashion Curatorship, and she was a senior curator at Fashion of the, at the v and for taking up two years of convent hair in 2013. To help the panel, and you out there in the audience, to identify and develop threads of ideas and themes um, emerging across this evening, we are very pleased to ha and happy to have another eminent academic amongst our, us to act as our chair. I'm not going to embarrass you, I promise. You will, okay. <laughs> Carol Tullick is Professor of Dress, Diaspora and Transnationalism, a role she juggles between UAL and the BNA. She is a member of the Transnational Art, Identity, and Nation Research Center based at UAL. Uh, and again, you can find that under the list of research centers at the UAL. It's called TRAIN for short. Carol has written and curated on dress and textiles associated with the African diaspora and explores the associated material and visual culture. Her curatorial work has developed these ideas, including celebrated exhibitions such as Black British Style, which she co-curated with Sean. Her continuing research explores the self through the styled black body, autobiography and biography, cultural heritage, cross-cultural and transnational relations, personal archives, and what she refers to as style narratives. I'm very pleased we asked Carol to chair the symposium. I witnessed her chair a uh, panel last week at a conference on Taste Art Bourdieu. She deftly challenged three academics to offer up rigorous, searching, imaginative papers on taste and the home and every day. She very cleverly introduced a stimulating task. <laughs> now I'm going to say it because it was great. Um, where she challenged um, the three presenters to develop ideas or themes for their papers. Carol sent them a photo of a material artifact, a champagne glass from her parents' glass cabinet as inspiration for the panel to bounce ideas around each other before they presented. Some might have considered the glass kitsch, but after listening to the panel Carol chaired, I think we can question the taste of those people. <laughs> it is this mix of the gentle, personal narrative and insightful, rigorous overview in Carol's work that I hope we emulate tonight. Before the discussion begins, some housekeeping. Um, we are filming this evening's event, as you can see quite clearly. And hopefully that you saw the signs on the door as well when you entered. 
exits are where you came in, so <laughs> if there is an alarm, it's not a test, please leave the way you came in down the front entrance, disperse for 10 minutes, and then hopefully everything will be fine, we can um, come back in. And uh, toilets are just through here in this corridor, just turn to the left. And we're planning on having a 10 minute break at some point um, this evening, maybe around 7 o'clock. We'll leave that up to Carol to judge. She can work out a, 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 a quiet moment in the discussion. There probably won't be any quiet moments in my <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. I'm going to hand over to Carol now to take the reins of the evening and hopefully begin a critically friendly interrogation <laughs> and debate surrounding the discipline of fashion curating. Thank you. Hello everyone, good evening. Um, thank you Ben for that introduction <laughs> which I didn't expect at all, but thank you. Um, and it's lovely to be here on, at this inaugural event for the uh, Centre for Fashion Curation. Um, I've been told that we're trying to keep it kind of free form, but um, trying to uh, dig out some ideas of where the centre wants to go and what's, the, um, what's going to inspire the centre to develop and what, um, on a bank of incredible exhibitions and publications that the, the team that's part of the, the centre have produced up to press. Um, so I'm going to start with a couple of questions for <coughs> the co-directors, Amy and Judith. And Amy, um, what is, the, what is the, the Centre for Fashion Curation? What is its mission? Well, the Centre was established late last year, um, and it coincided with a number of strategic appointments. And now the centre formally brings together um, the Fashion Space Gallery, the Fashion Archive, the International Programme, and also the MA in Fashion Curation. And core to any centre's activities is collaborative activity. So we will, we will continue to work independently, but we will work collaboratively, internally and externally, and generate all sorts of projects. And in a nutshell, um, our objective is to become an internationally recognized center of excellence for debating and developing innovative and rigorous strategies for fashion curation and um, to lead in the field of training and mentoring um, new practitioners. And Judith, in a continu continuation of what Amy's just said. Oh, my slides. Oh. <laughs> Do you want to show them, Amy? No, sorry, I forgot all my slides. <laughs> 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 um, why are we having this debate tonight? Well, it's, a bit, it's been a bit of a long time coming in that, as Amy said, we set up the centre a number of months ago. Um, but it's, it's a way of inviting you, you know, the audience, to, to sort of both overhear a conversation. So it's like a staged, you know, sort of um, a staged conversation but that is intended not to be that formal, in that we will invite, obviously, questions and debate from, you know, from the audience. And, um, and so I, I guess when, when we started talking about the centre, it was sort of not really what is a centre, because I think that will grow sort of exponentially, but it was more what is the discipline. And we realised how many different voices mm -hmm. Um, made up the centre and in a way how contentious those voices are and how much disagreement there is and kind of def def defensiveness in a way of the boundaries of what this discipline in is and can be and I think a lot of us have seen it you know grow and change so much in our own sort of professional lifetime that that we keep on redescribing it mm -hmm. and so we thought well why not start by looking at that, the description of what, what the discipline is, and invite, you know, sort of interested, you know, members of, of the profession and, and the public to come and sort of thrash it out with us, I guess. Okay. So in saying all of that, um, how are you going how are you planning to make sense of all the ideas that and discussions that come up this up this evening? Well, we'll disagree with some. <laughs> <laughs> we'll sort of, <laughs> we'll love, uh, we'll feel reassured by others, and we'll document all of them. And, and I guess, I mean, it is being filmed um, for our benefit as much as for, you know, the sort of, you know, general public's benefit if it's ever published or, you know, put a posted or whatever, whatever it may be, um, for us to go through and actually look at all the different descriptions of, of what the you know what fashion curating might be today you know and we're in the early stages of being a center and so i think we're very receptive to 
to, I mean, to, we're, we're in the process of developing our own ideas, but it's also a very good time to be incredibly receptive to feedback and what people's perception of what role the centre might fulfil. Okay. So, to add on to that, or extend that, and I love the way that you're saying about what is the discipline and this kind of dis defensive uh, per perspectives or stances towards what is fashion curation mm. today. Let's have a look at what members of the, um, of the centre are, are doing. So we're going to have short presentations from, um, from the members of the panel. So the first is going to be Alison Maloney. Thank you. You may have to... Oh, can I just add something before you start, which will make sense of, of these slides? Um, not obviously during the presentations, but, but whilst we're speaking, a number of quotes will come up on the screen. And they're quotes that all attempt to re-describe this discipline. And some are from the sort of 50s, 60s, 70s. And some will, of course, seem funny as in, you know, to us now, and some are still totally relevant and sort of poignant and, and rather profound, but it's, they're generally um, by, by professionals who are trying to articulate what it is and defend what it is they're, they're doing and highlighting their preoccupations. And um, so I apologise because I wanted to explain that, and in a way in that spirit, we wanted the voices, the individual voices of the... Um, of the centre to come to come out. So that's the, the point of the quotes and the individual um, insights into, into our disparate positions. Thank you. Thank you. Mine is uh, less of a, a presentation and, and more of an introduction to me as an emerging curator within this discipline. I joined the London College of Fashion in August last year as um, in a new role for the college to develop an international exhibitions program. I joined LCF from an organisation called the British Council, whose headquarters are in London, but which has offices in over 100 countries around the world. I worked as a fashion advisor for the organisation in a cross-disciplinary department which covered architecture and design. And although I covered mainly the work in fashion, I also worked in the other disciplines as well. As the British Council doesn't have a venue or a location as such, um, its offices, as I said, are, are dispersed around the world, I've never worked within one venue or programmed um, a series of events or exhibitions within a museum space that is constant. Instead, I've worked in diverse spaces around the world which are specific to the audience which the exhibition was trying to reach. And I've worked in countries as diverse as Yemen, Pakistan, Iran, Nigeria, Bangladesh, as well as more familiar countries in Europe, such as Italy and Portugal. My work is focused on collaboration, mainly. I enjoy collaboration, um, and I think that that enhances my ideas and my approach to um, curating exhibitions. I also commission new work, um, as well as working with existing objects. And I also enjoy working across disciplines. So just one example of a project which I worked on um, and co-curated um, with Catherine Ince, um, who is here tonight, who is now at the Barbican, um, was a project for the um, experimenter in Lisbon in Portugal in 2009. Um, we weren't satisfied with the venue which we were given um, to present our exhibition idea, so instead we decided to take our um, exhibition idea to the streets of Lisbon, and we commissioned a series of designers from across dis the disciplines of design to produce site-specific installations which um, reference the local craft skills and industry in Lisbon. So among them was the graphic designer Anthony Burrell who produced a series of posters which cited local phrases which he heard artisans use in the city. And these were fly posted around Lisbon during the festival. We also commissioned um, a jeweller called Linda Brothwell who um, did a residency in Lisbon uh, in the build up to the festival. And she learnt the local marketry skills and um, she used these to then repair park benches throughout the city of Lisbon as a permanent installation and gift to the city. Um, my projects here at the London College of Fashion will continue to work um, across disciplines in collaboration with curators and designers and I will continue to commission new work. 
One project that I'm currently working on with Judith Clark and Amy de la Haye is the response to the Venice Architecture Biennale proposal set forward by Rem Courthouse to the National Pavilions. And we're developing a project around fashion and modernity in 1914, which will launch later this year. I'm also going to um, tour a series of small exhibitions to audiences who can't access um, exhibitions easily. And I'm going to commission a series of new footwear designs in response to the archive that we have here at the London College of Fashion. And Jane? <coughs> um, whilst Laura's <laughs> getting that sorted out, what I was going to, um, to do was to, sort of, was to actually introduce um, the archive by showing you a film. Um, that was actually made by an MA student on the um, fashion media and production course, because I think it's a really nice way of, of showing what the sort of the, the, the research centre probably of, of, of the, the centre <laughs> is the physical objects, the physical archive, and how being part of this centre will sort of help sort of inform the collaborations and conversations um, within the archive. And, and sort of explore ways of actually curating what we have, the old-fashioned objects that we actually have. So this film only lasts for about a minute, and then I'll just give you a bit more context about the archive. Thanks. Green Sally up, and Green Sally down. Last time Scott got a tail to the ground. Green Sally up, and Green Sally down. Last time Scott got a tail to the ground. Green Sally up, and Green Sally down. shows you the static, the sort of the, the, the very um, weighty <laughs> um, centre of, of the archive and that, that collection of, it's a repository of collections, there's about a hundred collections that make up the London Culture Fashion Archive. It's not a museum, it's an archive um, and it's unusual in an archive in that it actually contains artefacts. We've got hundreds of, of artefacts which include garments, hats, shoes, um, photographs and lots of other fashion objects. And each collection has its own unique story. So in that respect, they are archives because they tell a story, they tell a unique story about how that collection was collected, the people who collected them, the organisations that collected them. But they are interconnected with um, shared narratives. Um, and so I'm just very excited that the archive is brought into something that can start exploring how that can be opened up, how that can be expanded out, how we can actually make what is now hidden, what is, what is in storerooms, locked in storerooms, wrapped in tissue, in calico bags, in boxes and archive boxes, um, preserved for the students and researchers and scholars to use, but they are hidden, and how we can actually get that out into the open, how we can kind of like engage people with it. Um, we don't have an exhibition space, we do loan stuff out to the collections, but, uh, to, to, to exhibitions, but the key thing is that we encourage people to come in and handle. It's, it's a very much a handling collection. It's for students and researchers to really investigate, to scrutinise and interrogate, and to interpret and reinterpret what they're seeing. Um, and so I'm, I'm really pleased to be part of this. <laughs> um, and I'm hoping that you know, we can sort of really think about what the archive is and how we can really sort of bring it forward, make it more accessible, stop it being so hidden. So, thank you. Lovely, thank you, Jane. Sean? 
Um, thank you. Um, the Curation and Culture Programme is a new programme um, within the Graduate School, um, and I think it was very insightful of our re relatively new Dean and with the support of our Head of College, Francis Corner, to focus on the importance of curation um, within the College. Um, and while, as Amy said, the, the MA Fashion Curation will be a very serious part of the centre, what I would like to think is that the rest of the courses yeah. within that programme, which include History and Culture of Fashion, Fashion and Film, Fashion Futures, Costume Design for Performance, uh, an MSc in Applied Psychology for Fashion and an MA in Psychology for Fashion Professionals, that can all look at culture and curation in different ways and I think will allow perhaps some interesting conversations about how we situate curation and what curation can mean and what fashion curation can mean and what the boundaries of fashion curation are and can be going forward. Um, I thought I should just say perhaps a little bit about myself um, and my engagement. I'm delighted to be part of the centre. Oh, I thought there were some pictures there, but they're not. Never mind, <laughs> that's fine. Don't need pictures. Um, <laughs> Um, for many years before I came to London College of Fashion, I was a curator at the Victoria and Albert Museum, um, where I met, I think, most of the other members of, of the, um, the, the, the centre, so there's an interesting relationship there, I think. Um, I did a number of jobs while I was there. I worked in the um, uh, prints and drawings department, where I had responsibility for the fashion-related collections. So, Similar to some of the things that Jane looks after, it wasn't actually the garments as such as fashion photography, fashion illustration, fashion designs, bizarre mixed ephemera, but kind of building up that way of thinking about fashion. Um, and then I moved to the contemporary programme, um, where fashion was a very big part of that, but fashion within a broader context. So in some ways, what the centre is doing and thinking about the contextualisation of fashion. Um, while I was there, I curated a number of fashion-related exhibitions uh, dressing the male, which looked at the representation of men and fashion through uh, fashion plates. With Carol, as Ben mentioned, we co-curated the Black British Style exhibition and a number of events around that. Part of the contemporary programme was about not necessarily traditional exhibition curations, but installations, events, such as the Friday Late, where I got to work with Claire. Um, and while I've, I've moved here to London College of Fashion, and my, my practice, I guess, has moved away from direct curation as such, um, I'm still kind of very involved and engaged in the way in which, as, 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 as course leader for MA History and Culture of Fashion, the way curation, museums, exhibitions are very much a part of that history and culture of fashion and an integral part of that. Um, I've also recently um, acted as an advisor for two exhibitions, um, one of which was Claire's, um, the 80s uh, Club Walk, Club, Club to Catwalk, yeah. 80s London Fashion, and the Queer History of Fashion at um, FIT in New York. Um, and I'm currently working on um, writing an essay for a book that's being edited by Hazel Clark and Anna Marie Vanska called Fashion Curating Now, where she's asked me to look at the presentation of um, lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, transgender representation in fashion, which takes, which I'm taking as a starting point, the street style exhibition that Amy very kindly got me involved in and launched me on my kind of research career, right up to the exhibition at um, FIT recently and how that might go forward and other, other kind of representations. So very much interested in ideas around masculinity and dress and dress and identities. And I'm delighted to be part of this centre. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Claire. Yeah. So I've been given a special allowance to talk about <laughs> my current project um, in a bit more detail. Um, you will all have been aware of this blockbuster at the Met in 2011. And when the exhibition happened, I just felt absolutely delighted that it was happening, it didn't really matter to me where it was happening and I had to go and see it. Of course the v would have quite liked it, but actually the way it's turned out I think has been really good because after the enormous success of the exhibition and a gap, we now have the opportunity to represent it. It's quite an unusual situation in some ways for the v to take another major museum's major exhibition. And in some ways it should be easy if something exists that, that we 
bring into the museum, then one could say, well, it's, it's done, it's accomplished. But actually, things have changed. We can look back on the exhibition with hindsight. We can perhaps amplify the exhibition, re-edit, reconsider, certainly create a new publication. So I'm just going to go through um, a few slides to show those of you who didn't see it and met. Um, one of the great things about the V&A is that it's so big and we are able to dedicate another third, more, um, in terms of footprint, um, a third gallery. We're not actually adding another third, third um, quantity of objects. We simply have more space to enjoy the exhibition because I think one of the things I felt in the Metro, I, I went in the, in the last few weeks, halfway through I felt absolutely panicked because I couldn't see a way forward or a way back. It was so chock a block, so we're giving it more physical space. We're also changing the entrance to the exhibition, again, because we have more space, and we are installing this huge neon sculpture. And what's really uh, going to be important about the exhibition is, is the sound and the AV. And this neon bird flaps its wings, and immediately as we go in, we, we enter this magical world. And birds were a recurring theme in Queen's collections. Another thing we're doing is introducing um, it's almost a portal into the mind of McQueen. We very much respect the existing curation and working closely with Andrew Bolton on it, but we wanted to bracket the show. We wanted to assert McQueen's Londonness. Seems slightly ironic that we're starting with Highland Rape, which <laughs> dealt with Scottishness, but it does situate McQueen at a particular point in time when, with this collection, he had such an enormous impact on the fashion world. And here we're actually going to be introducing his voice and hopefully that of Katie England, explaining that focus on the metropolis. The next gallery is pretty much the same. This deals with tailoring and silhouette, which recurs in, in many ways throughout the entire exhibition. So here you see particular cuts, the bumsters, the particular cut of um, his jackets, which... Um, were inspired by a lot of pieces in the v &A. And then Gothic, this was a recurring theme, and we're really pleased that Catherine Spooner is going to be writing about Gothic, and Queen's Gothic sensibility in the publication. Um, I emailed her, and she just picked up the phone immediately and said, this is my dream commission, and immediately started talking about McQueen's leather corsets and Frankenstein, and I thought, she's perfect, perfect for this. <laughs> And then primitivism, a huge theme in, in the Queen's work. Um, in the Met Exhibition, there were two aspects. One was the, the collection, uh, for example, the piece you see on the right from It's a Jungle Out There, which is very direct in its references. But then we are going to include this beautiful film, which you can see at the top by John Mabry. And it's based on a collection which was inspired by a shipwreck. And the film is of somebody plunging underwater and almost being drowned by their dress. The chiffon wraps around them like tentacles. And I really like this film very, very much, and I, I'm thinking a lot about how to write about it. And then romantic nationalism. And here you see McQueen at his most grand. We are going to commission hand-carved sconces inspired by grinning gibbons that will have skulls instead of flowers. And I think here McQueen is in, in a way expressing the 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 grandeur of fashion, but also the romantic nature of his view of it. And then at the heart of the exhibition and publication is the Cabinet of Curiosities. And in the book, I'm calling this Museum of the Mind because, in a way, it provides access into not only his obsessions and preoccupations and his identity as a collector and a patron. It gives us a chance to look at the way he collaborated with people like Sean Lee and Sarah Harmony to add Philip Tracy and, and many others to um, push them harder than they really wanted. But in a way, um, his, his extremely high standards and intolerance of any compromise rubbed off on them. And a lot of the different people he collaborated with have said to me how they didn't think that it was possible to make what they made. Um, and in the publication, Caroline Evans is going to be writing about how these objects um, 
speak. She, her essay is called Evocations, and we spent this morning in the Queen Archive looking at objects like this and just feeling completely privileged and overwhelmed by them. And then in Metro, the Pepper's Ghost of Kate Moss was tiny, but uh, in our revisiting of this, we're going to make it bigger. We want to make it life-size, if possible. And again, it's, it's a, an apparition of extreme beauty. And we have our new head of research at the V&A um, speaking about this in relationship to um, Macbeth and Jacobean drama, um, the, the, the sense of apparition and ghostliness. And then exoticism, another very strong theme. Um, one of the interesting things about McQueen was that he had a really extensive art collection and he was friends with the Chapman Brothers and Damien Hurst. And we discovered a series of chess sets designed by these artists, which he, he was very interested in. Um, and he did a collection called It's Only a Game, which pits the East against the West. And this notion of the, the combat in fashion and how, um, how his work drew on what was happening in contemporary art is really important to the publication. And then Naturalism is probably my favourite gallery. It's very museological, it's faded, it's pulled back, it's quite melancholy, it's a bit Miss Havisham-ish. And I particularly like the dress on the far left with the real flowers that fell out and died as it was being worn. I think it's quite um, uh, um, elegiac about the, the melancholy of fashion and its uh, transitory nature. And then the exhibition ends with Plato's Atlantis, and this is the collection that I'm writing about in the book. Again, I was looking at those very shoes this morning and just marvelling at the, the mind that considered that a fashion show, in all its commercial and practical nature, could allude to um, a Darwinian sense of devolution where humankind is forced to return to the water in the face of catastrophe and that he should create something so beautiful and lyrical. And not only that, push forward the techniques of digital printing. And so I think it's this marvellous relationship between craft and, I guess, couture skills, but also a sense of foreboding and also bringing in technology. I find this collection absolutely fascinating. These are the V&A editions. Sorry, don't need to really detail, and then the publication which I've mentioned already, which is just getting longer by the day. Okay. And then a little bit about the technique which we're hoping to get into the publication. It's not something that the exhibition really addresses. I think the exhibition is about spectacle. And then for the um, further outputs at the v &A, but also wonderfully at an exhibition here in the fashion space which Le Guy is going to um, lead on, and it's going to address the use of cosmetics in the Queen and we're very lucky that Jeremy Smith is going to write in the book on um, how, well, I, I think this is what she's going to do, something on the Freudian interpretation of cosmetics in Queen's work. Lovely, thank, thank you. Um, <coughs> I'm going to go off my plan a bit, um, and I wasn't quite sure why I decided to just let everyone speak and I didn't interrupt, say something between each one, but I'm really pleased that I heard each panellist um, after succession and things that have come up for me is the grand and intimate statement. So with Alison, and we've worked together, Alison and I, on a project that we did in six weeks <laughs> for the British Council, but it was during when you showed that, um, the bench, you know, using intimate spaces. I know you wanted to kind of have a, a, a museum case to that moves around in different spaces <coughs> and then Claire's exhibition Alex Alexander McLean a grand um, gesture or as you just said spectacle and it reminded me of I don't know if anyone saw Yenka Shanavori's exhibition at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park last year called Fabric Asians and it was really a retrospective but he produced two new pieces of work which was I'm not quite sure how tall it was but I definitely taller than this room, scarf, what, what looked like a giant scarf that had been caught by the wind, that's what he'd done, he'd blown it, and, and then it was the African textile, um, based on the African textile, which was kind of a, well, someone else said it was a dandy who'd taken the hanky out of his bucket and just thrown it and then caught that, but it was a summation of that 
design, that artist work or designers work in the same, in the case of um, Alexander McQueen. And then the other intimate spaces is the archive, which some people still fear the archive, whereas I believe in the power of the archive. Um, and it was lovely when you were saying that you want to, you know, bring it out, but that it no longer remains hidden. Yet yeah, we're still saying this in the 21st century about um, <laughs> archives is unbelievable. And then, of course, Sean has done has worked on both sides of that, whereas the grand gestures that we worked <laughs> on and other exhibitions, as well as smaller pieces like the hair day or to to two events, which were just one day events, were telling different narratives by individuals coming in and showing uh, um, uh, aspects of their body, whether it's tattoos or black hair designs, um, as well as that wonderful exhibition we both worked on called Fashion on Paper, which, mm. which was just about, not just, it was about magazines and illustrations. Um, so what Judith said right at the beginning, that diversity of voices, that, di that diversity of practices, how do we kind of begin to understand the discipline of fashion curation? Um, and as I say, I'm going off piece a bit. I was just thinking, let's have some questions from the audience. Um, at this point, and then we'll go back to asking questions from the panel. I mean, me asking questions from the panel, but over to you. <laughs> um, in relation to Jane's comment about the archives, which is an amazing space, do you think, uh, I was thinking the other day when I was looking through what seemed to me to be stuff, but actually, when I started looking through it, I started to think, actually, if I created this a bit more, I might use it more if you think that's the, you know, how you see creation. If you create, if you create objects and stuff, you'll actually sort of use it more. I think so. <coughs> I think the, I mean, the archive is a gathering together of certain things. An archive is, is a particularly unique collection. But within those, there are individual pieces, and those pieces have a story of themselves. And if you can sort of tie up the stories and sort of bring out narratives, then you know, it opens it up, and just having one piece that's perhaps, for example, um, on exhibition in a museum somewhere else, that brings people in who, who sort of say, well, I've seen that shoe in Northampton, what other shoes have you got? And then people start sort of asking about things like that. So, yeah, I think, you know, you can't, an archive is there to keep stuff together, but I'm a great believer that there's no point in having something if it doesn't get used, and the way of getting it used is to get stories out based around the objects. Um, so yes, definitely. And um, can I add to the answer as well from a, from a sort of, I mean, absolutely supporting what Jane says, but I think in the center, what we're trying all the time to think is what is unique about fashion as opposed to any other media? And collecting fashion, it could be argued, is distinctive because whereas people might collect ceramics or glass strategically, often when we collect fashion, it creeps up on us. And so garments that perhaps have been brought to war, to the wear, they've been stored, at some point, often, we look at them with new eyes and we see them through the lens of a collection mm -hmm. in a way that perhaps with ceramics, you know, you randomly are given one piece or you fall in love with one piece and then you start acquiring. I think that perhaps one of the features that's distinctive about a fashion collection is that quite often it does creep up on the owner. And, you know, what wasn't a collection, what was once a mass of clothes is, as you said, it becomes, you can look at it through the lens of a collection and then its primary function, perhaps, is less about consumption and wearing, but more about interpretation. I think that's so true, because when I was, it was mainly magazines, and I was looking at like, old copies of magazines, and sort of when I used to live in the East End, like magazines that at that point were at that point in that time. And now when I look back on 10 years ago, they're probably cultural artifacts, mm -hmm. uh, And I just thought, oh, actually, you know, using curation is a great way to sort of understand more about what you have, but also what exists. And it's also going to be time-based as well. There's going to be different times when you're going to be looking at it in different ways. Um, and so, yeah, you know, sort of that's one of the key things about an archive is that we are actually collecting heritage. We're looking after heritage, but we're also looking at what the future heritage is going to be as well. So that's got to sort of feed into it too. And how does that, how do we have something that then will inform um, you know, future sort of discussions and, and exhibition and ideas. But what I think was, I mean, the one of the points that I really wanted to make was 
that, I mean, I think as curators we're concerned about preserving objects and caring for objects, but increasingly I think I'm also becoming interested in the words we use to describe those objects mm -hmm. and that we preserve the words. Mm -hmm but also the use of terminology. Mm -hmm. And in the past, I think people were perhaps very, very clear about what a curator was. And now one of my bugbears is when people are telling me that they curate a conference and they curate a shop window. <laughs> and part of the reason that we put the terminology up was to get people to actually think about the way we use words mm -hmm. um, and the way that we use words to describe exhibitions, like we use the word perhaps traditional or spectacle, or, and to actually really perhaps tonight help unravel those as well. Mm -hmm. Because they're words we routinely use, mm -hmm. um, but we need to really think about what they mean and how we use them. So I think come. Okay. Okay. I have a question following probably your comments. Because a few years ago, or decades ago, we experienced a big rise of um, design curation. And I'm just wondering whether you can uh, think a little bit whether you're going to ask the centre and ask the product as well of the, um, of the experience of design curation, but especially in London, it's, it's, it's so difficult. Um. Well, it goes across what all, all of our preoccupations in a way, um, and it depends in a way what where fashion appears within an umbrella of design and where the, where the two things are serve a common master in terms of finding new ways of exhibiting, narrating, describing, etc. Um, and fashion has always had a rather ambiguous role within, you know, design with a capital D. So um, I suppose for the, for the sake of this evening, we're, we're being very specific. But I think you're right. I think that we've got available to us a lot of experiments that are going on, you know, simultaneously that perhaps have a longer history. And of course, design with a, you know, with a capital D has a longer history. Um, of a kind of different recognition within the museum. Whereas I think uh, fashion was, in a way, the underdog for, for slightly longer, perhaps, um, as opposed to textile, which is something quite other that you'll see come round as a preoccupation on the, um, on the quotes. Um, but, but I think generally people are more articulate ab about curating and what it might be. And I think it's precisely because of this in a way that we're having this conversation, that everybody knows what, what they think they mean by curating or curating design. And in fact, it's, it's, it's got very sort of, mul it's got multiple descriptions, both amongst us and I'm sure all of you have a quite distinct idea of what you think curating design or curating fashion might be. I wonder if as well, adding on to that, but whether it's entwined with gender, because when you're talking about design, I tend to think of the Design Museum, which developed from the Council of Industrial Design, and tended to be associated with sort of masculinities and what could be perceived as masculine design, whereas fashion comes from a very different history, which was predominantly about women's wear and women curators. And what's very exciting about the discipline now is that that is expanding mm -hmm. and opening wide up. But I think also it's entwined with gender, the, the notion of the separate sort of design and museums. Just to add on to that, in terms of your observation, in terms of design curating becoming more visible as well, I think you're right in terms of the MA at Kingston being established. And I think also um, furniture fairs such as the Milan Furniture Fair, which was traditionally very much a commercially focused um, industry event, has become over the last 10 years much more about installation site-specific projects, which again cross the disciplines of um, of furniture design, graphics, and there have been fashion installations there as well. So I think the, the discipline of curation, not just within fashion, um, but a, across the board, is um, definitely a discipline which people are looking more closely at in terms of um, an occupation that they might go into. And um, I'm, for, in terms of my practice, I'm very inspired by the work of people like Daniel Charney, who is a design curator, and the way that he approaches experimental ways in which he um, presents um, furniture and product design, and also the work of institutions like the Architecture Foundation, where they do site-specific work and try and bring in local audiences into their um, foundation to um, speculate about what architecture in the built environment is. Um, I was thinking it's slightly off curation in a way, but it, but it is related. I was thinking about the way in which 
the discussion around disciplines develop and the way in which you know there was a new design history that came out of art history that became a new subject and it's the way in which we're now hearing you know fashion studies as a kind of new way of thinking about um, fashion and dress as a kind of interdisciplinary approach as relate as opposed to a kind of very traditional costume or dress and you know we won't get into those or we might get into those <laughs> debates but I think you know th there are lessons to be learned aren't there in how we think in a kind of either narrow disciplinary way or a kind of cross into transdisciplinary way about where fashion sits and where fashion and curation sit yeah. in relation to what's gone before in, in, in opening up a subject. Can I, can I add to that in terms of the yeah. V&A? Um, when I first joined the V&A in 1979, um, there was, had been for many, many years just one curator dealing with the whole of fashion. And a 20th century fashion curator was a relatively recent appointment. And it was met with, the appointment was met with great hostility from, I guess, more traditional textile curators, which links back to what Judith mentioned, in the sense that textiles were um, serious and fashion wasn't, and yet the two were t totally independent. And I think that so much has changed in, in my world, in the v which is, you know, the time I came to RCF, pretty much the only place I'd ever worked. And it seems that, on the one hand, you could argue that museums have woken up to the commercial potential of exhibitions. But I prefer to th think that that's a byproduct of a growing realization that this is a vast sea of fascinating and unplanned depths that can have so many different ways of being interrogated. And just within the museum itself, the way that we work in different departments with the library, with the archive of art and design, with the Wedding Image Department, where we first met with the new contemporary team, which I headed up for about 18 months, and the sense that just within the microcosm of, of one museum, we have this state of constant revelation about connections. And if I can give you an example, somebody, um, sorry to bring it back to McQueen, but I get very tunnel vision about my projects. <laughs> somebody mentioned to me, oh, one of his favorite books was, and this is a book of late 19th century and early 20th century photography, which I rushed out and got, and it's an enormous thick book, and we started going through it, and we're just bowled over by the sort of McQueenish type black and white and sepia images, many of them um, referring to natural history collections. And then it reminded me that in our collection, in, in the museum, we have something called the Animal Products Collection. It's about 800 textiles, um, including an entire albatross wing. And this strange relic of a way of collecting materials associated with fashion and textiles, the fact that we still have it. You know, this albatross wing has been waiting for a hundred years <laughs> for me to go and look at it. And it was intended to be made into a, to a muff. Um, and then in terms of these, these photographs, I showed them to our photography curator, Susanna mm -hmm. Brown. She said, oh, well, half of them in the v collection. I thought, oh, it's just, you know, <laughs> too much. So we're going to bring them into the publication. But if you multiply that, that geography of a museum into the wider landscape of life and all the different aspects of it and think about the potential for research into fashion from many different aspects, it's absolutely mind-boggling. And life just isn't long enough to do everything and to do, to do all the exhibition ideas and books that we want to do. So my view is that the more fashion curators or whatever we call ourselves there are, the better. Because actually, the more we look, the more we find. There was a moment when we Hello there, hi. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, when we think about fashion creations, normally we think about um, exhibition in a museum, but how can we place fashion creation um, outside museum framework? Out of, sorry, what framework? Um, museum. museum, like a museum exhibition framework. <coughs> Why can we think about fashion creation outside well, I mean, uh, well, by doing all sorts of outreach projects, the sort of projects that Alison's doing, for a start. I mean, sort yes. of, so if you can't get people to come to the museum and to the objects, ideally we take those objects to the people. And so that we're inclusive in our practice. And, I mean, Ben's uh, May thesis was about dealing with museums and mental health issues, and lots of people, you know, feel they perhaps for various reasons can't leave the home. 
and so engage sort of exploring online solutions um, absolutely I totally agree I mean to, to give an example Sean uh, you, you got involved in this as well I think <laughs> um, it, it occurred to me as we approached the millennium all those years ago that the VNA wasn't doing anything and I'd left it too late there's no gallery space whatever so we got photographers all over Europe to photograph people on the street in a 12-hour period um, up to midnight and after it and then the idea was they would all send their photographs in in early January and we turned them into posters and we put them in the poster holders in the tunnel between South Kent Tube and the VNA without asking permission <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and luckily it was thought okay but there's always somewhere to put stuff yeah. And I just need to add to that, my husband was one of those photographers. That's <laughs> 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 yeah, what we've got. Can you, with the hat, Beanie? Hello. Hi. I'm from the University of Brighton, and I've spent the last five years studying under the close supervision of Lee Taylor. And we're very object based, and we have a collection. And our, my question is I, I did an exhibition in our local shopping centre that related to the local history. Um, 900,000 people walked past my six glass cabinets. And the reaction, the center was inundated with positive feedback. Mm -hmm. My mum did that, we used to live in this street, this da 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 da. Taking the dress history out of the museum, into the public, I think, is a formidable way of, of expanding the importance of dress history and getting it out, because that's what it's about, because we avoid clothes. Uh, do you have a proactive plan for this centre to engage your students to communicate outside the London College of Fashion? Well, it's, it's, it's started already. I mean, Sean's students have used um, items, suits, from the archive and, and, and uh, curated exhibitions just in Carnaby Street. Great. Um, I've taken a, a wedding dress to Great Ormond Street Hospital um, and engaged kids who are, who are long term ill about, you know, what is this? Even, even 13 year old boys got excited about a wedding dress. <laughs> so, <coughs> and there's lots of um, you know, outreach so projects, widening white participation projects. Yes, I mean, that's one of the things I really, really want to sort of really push with the, the archive. I, I get students to come in, um, I do object based learning sessions with them. It's there for them to learn from. And I want that to kind of like go out further. We've, we've got a lot of online collections. Not, not all of our collections are online, but those are available to the public as well. So I think it's, it's very much Yeah, and in our, um, in our MA fashion curation course, the um, contemporary practice that Judith runs, you should say, but on the second term, one of the projects is that the students, without any money at all, have to go and generate an exhibition in an external space. And we've said that if it came to it, it could be hypothetical, and every single year they've achieved it from a prison to a, you know, a disused shop to all sorts of venues. Um, and also, yeah, I mean, we've got exhibitions planned. We're not going to tell you all our plans. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, where we'll take, the, <coughs> we'll take things to people who physically can't come to the museum. The London College of Fashion has an extensive widening participation programme, bringing in new audiences to the college and taking our work out there. So um, the centre is um, working with that team to yeah. develop project ideas. Okay. So exciting. Thank you. So just Was the lady in the question, purple? Yeah. Well, Jane, it's related to what you said earlier. Um, I was just wondering, in terms of acquisition policy, um, how much of what you collect, um, an object and the related ephemera, um, is collected with uh, an exhibition in mind? And also, um, in relation to the vocabulary um, that you use within the archive, is there kind of, do you feel inclined to comment on things like scent and how things? Mm feel um, sort of considering how you could commission a centre or incorporate that into an exhibition? Um, do you want to start? Mm. Well, from the archive point of view, I, 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 I'm quite pragmatic that, <coughs> you know, we've got limited space, we've got limited resources. Um, we are developing a collection development policy. We're looking at ways of actually sort of making the, um, the management structure and the, the collection structure much more robust. And that's, one of, again, one of the really um, useful things about being part of the centre that I can bring in expertise and knowledge to 
to sort of help inform that so that we're looking at how we can really put in place very good structures. As I said earlier, it's not a museum, it's an archive, and it's very unusual because it's got lots of artefacts in it. Um, but within the archive, um, the collection really has to relate back to the college, it has to sort of go back to the origins of, of um, the college, its story, its history, the people that have been associated with it, its alumni, its staff, its current students, um, and that's the kind of like the main focus of collection. At the moment, the collection develop the, the, the collection policy is, is in draft form, <laughs> um, and so eventually that will sort of develop. But, but a good example of um, because we have started <coughs> of perhaps the sort of collaborations that might not formally have taken place is that I'm working with Martin Pell um, from Brighton <laughs> Museum, and we're going to be working right through the museum collection, his collection, redefining it and helping develop a strategic policy for it using museological practice. And then I can bring that experience back. I can teach the students. I can liaise with Jane. Um, and it perpetuates it. So I think that's what sort of, it's a sort of, you know, we're starting quite gently, but those are the sort of collaborations. But in terms of multisensoriality, mm. Um, yes, it's something that, I mean, we teach. I've got a PhD student, Sarah Chong Kwan, who's looking at um, multi-sensorial experience in everyday dress. And now I need, I've got an opportunity to s plug the book that I was going to plug at the very beginning in <laughs> my first <laughs> sentence. Um, <laughs> Judith and I, the centre also coincided with the publication of our book, um, Exhibiting Fashion Before and After, 1971. And, um, I don't know, but it would seem that Cecil Beaton in 1971 was possible. Oh, no, in 1946, it was the first time they ex um, in Britain can make it at the V&A that they um, used perfume and different multisensorial experiences. And then Beaton did it in a 1971. So I think it's something that as historians we're becoming increasingly interested in exploring and analysing, but it is something that has been in practice certainly since 1946 and possibly earlier. I, I don't know whether this is true, but I, I read that in the 1851 exhibition, there were, there were fountains of eau de cologne. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lovely PhD in that. <laughs> yeah, but really interesting. I mean, so yes, we are really interested in, yeah, multisensory experience. <laughs> Well, when we sort of describing the objects, um, I don't think there's any. Yeah, um, I, I, I suppose I'm just used to the musty smell, so I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but it informs um, our writing, I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the garments. I mean, a lot of the garments actually show the wear. They show the, li the life lived, and you know, it's got. They've got stains down the front. We don't clean them. We just make sure that they're stable. That they they don't have any insects living on them, um, particularly moth. Um, and that they're not going to sort of completely disintegrate as soon as you tr try and sort of store them. Um, we've got a, a beautiful silk chiffon um, Tia Porter skirt that the hem stuck up with sellotape, and it's like, oh my God, I can't, you know, <laughs> don't touch that. Um, and, and, you know, there's cigarette burns, and there's wine stains, and there's goodness knows what on the fronts of the garments, and there's sweat stains. And, and they're all there to kind of like give the story of that, that object. Kind of and the unique mm. nature of that object, Absolutely. which is fashion, in a way that we mark our clothes, and we imprint them with wear, in a way that perhaps we, we do mark. I mean, obviously, people who make ceramics mark the ceramic, but we don't, in everyday life, mark our furniture or physically change it. So again, that multisensorial experience, it could be argued, is quite, or, or particularly specific um, to also, fashion. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was just going to say that, you know, we're, we're in, as we encourage the students to use the mm. archive, you know, part of, part of that as well, you know, Jane is a one-woman band doing a fantastic job <laughs> with, with a mass of objects. So one of the things that, you know, we've had lots of conversations about is how if a student goes into the archive, if they use the objects, if they explore the objects, part of the quid pro quo is that their investigation, perhaps mm -hmm. particularly where they're doing a material culture analysis and thinking about, you know, how Sarah's particularly thinking about new ways and that, you know, that that can add to the information mm -hmm. that Jane has either inherited from previous archivists or that, you know, their new collections coming in mm -hmm. that she doesn't herself have time to do. So I think, you know, it can be a kind of collaborative process, can't it, where mm -hmm different people looking at the same object mm. 
which I think you know relates yeah. back to mm -hmm. so many people but it's work to do with our own think position. about it differently yeah, yeah. and can offer a new yeah. perspective mm -hmm. on something yeah. you think you've told the whole story about and suddenly someone sees it differently mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask or smells something? it differently because I, <laughs> I think it's, it's a very good question for another reason as well as in when you describe something do you say it's musty mm -hmm. and one of the things about being a curator is how subjective and how objective you are and what we're allowed mm. to be. How subjective are we allowed to be as curators? And this has been central to a lot of the debates because the minute you put your own opinion, let's say, into the equation, it raises all sorts of other questions. How objective are you? Which is why captions can be so banal. And they can be so banal because the curator has removed he, himself or herself from the equation. And I think it's a very interesting sort of site of, of experiment, if you like, that this little sort of unassuming, often, you know, um, text next to an object um, can be a, a, a site of such, of such debate. And I think you, you're at the heart of it in that sense, of whether you allow yourself to write the word, you know, musty mm. on the description, yeah. or do you have to stick to size, date, you know, material, you know, perhaps at best state of decay. I was in a oh, sorry, you know, I was in a conference last week, and um, there was a woman from ICROM, which is an international organisation supporting museums, and she did the most amazing workshop. She said, whereby she just got people to come into the room, and then she said, stay exactly where you are. She got an unspecified object, and she got them all to sketch it and describe it. Um, and the bottom line was that everybody sees it from quite literally a different perspective depending on their position in the room, but also it makes you question the, the perspective you use when you describe that object mm -hmm. and what your own cultural positioning is, but also mm -hmm. your own physical positioning at a point in time. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's such a wonderful mm -hmm. exercise that makes that so explicit. Oh, sorry. Yeah. But, but I also but I need to introduce Jeff because I didn't say that when I mentioned our book that um, Dr. Jeff Horsley, who was Judith and my PhD student, wrote it with us. And I'm sorry, because I meant to say you'd written it with us. <laughs> no, I was just going to add that I'm, I'm fascinated by... Oh, sorry. I'm fascinated by Judith's comment, because one of the things I think that we rarely touch on in discussing curating is the process of authorship mm. and an ownership of authorship. And I'm, I'm fascinated when you say, when you use the word allow, because my first question is, who does or doesn't grant permission for what does or doesn't happen, yeah. um, and how that relates to curatorship as a process of authorship, but also, as I've always seen it, as a process of self-expression. Mm. And I think that notion of self-expression self in relation to subjectivity and objectivity is something that I think is really interesting to explore mm -hmm. as a curator. Can I just add something? I know that's really naughty because I am a chair, but it's just a very interesting <laughs> <laughs> point. Now you've got ultimate power. But it was just I um, did an exhibition at the Women's Library around, they invited me and it was their theme around advice on the teenage girl. And the um, lovely Edwina Airman told me about a pair of jeans that they had at the Museum of London, which belonged to a young woman who was anorexic and, um, and died in a fire. And I thought, where do I start with these? Because the jeans was incredibly thin. And I thought, I don't know where to start. And I thought, I'll ask her parents. They were both still alive. Do they want to write a caption for this? Write as much as they like, and I can work with them to edit it. But the person was a fashion historian. And so she wrote the text within the allotted 50 words. It was an incredibly moving text, but it was perfect because it was them speaking about their daughter, being quite honest about her illness, but also about her loss. And that thing of, I just didn't want, I just wanted to be there as the person who chose the object, and they agreed that it could be there, and then let them say what they wanted to say about their daughter. So that thing about, I think that's lovely, that process of authorship. I think that's a really fantastic way of explaining that. So, can yeah. I just add what I'm, I guess what I'm talking about? Oops, thank you. <laughs> I guess what I'm talking about, it's interesting that you revert to expression and authorship in linguistic form. Mm. 
And I suppose what I'm talking about is yeah. self-expression and authorship in spatial mm. form, which is what an exhibition is. But I think the caption's part of that as well. You, for me, you can't separate the two. Mm. And I know what you mean about sometimes the captions can be banal, but I think that's when they, it really, they, th those two elements really take yeah, off. I don't think they're banal mm. at all. I think they're profound. But I just think they're specific, and I think mm, sometimes they're, they're considered banal mm. because of the hierarchy of information that seems to have been repeated so often that it's as though people are sort of prescient about them, whereas the other bits of the exhibition perhaps are received as creative acts in a different way. And in fact, I think they're all, as you say, I, I mean, I think they are sort of interconnected. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, everything we've been discussing, that's kind of what I wanted to ask um, um, Jane about. Do you, do you, in your archive, over the years and years of the, the collections that have come in, and all the different people who made the choices to collect, do you ever feel that there are curators amongst the, the, the archivists? You know, because, I mean, the, as, as is discussed now, there's lots of conscious decisions. Um, so the people who, who selected the pieces that are now in the archive, in their own right, they, they in some respects, are curating many exhibitions within the, the bigger collection. Um, do, you, do you, as you're working with the archive now, do you see very different voices over the decades? Yeah, yeah, very much. Uh, I mean, I've been in the position for two years, um, and the archive really sort of came into being in the sort of the 1990s. Um, and it, its core is the story of the college, and that in itself is a very interesting voice because the person who brought that together was the first head of college for, for one of the constituent courses. And so you get a really interesting voice there of what she collected and what she kept. And, um, and then that collection itself had been curated before it came into the archive because, again, what was kept and what wasn't kept. Um, and then there's very interesting bits of collections that have been brought together and labelled the tailoring archive, for example, which consists of all sorts of things that have come from all sorts of people, um, which individually might not sort of mean anything, but they've been curated by the, um, the previous archivist into what is called the tailoring collection. <laughs> so, so within the collections, I mean, there's, a, there's about a hundred, over a hundred discrete, what I would call discrete collections within the archives. Um, and that will range from thousands of photographs to one pair of shoes and everything in between. Um, and the way they've kind of like come in, I think, are fascinating stories in themselves. You know, the story behind that. Um, so at the moment, it's sort of they're there, um, and then you realise the interconnections. And so you sort of, in your mind, you're when somebody comes and sort of talks to you about uh, their research, you suddenly curate from different collections things that kind of like refer to what. They're, they're researching, and so you're bringing then sort of different objects from the different collections. So yeah, I, I think it's an ongoing process. It's it's definitely. So do you think it's also cumulative that each archivist after the other, yeah. you know, each <laughs> people who make the decisions after the other, kind of are informed by as well as bring their own voice? Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. 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 So I'm going to have one more question, and then Claire, I'm going to ask Claire questions. Claire. Oh, sorry, Claire. I just wanted to add something about what we write about objects. Um, falls into two categories. One, one would be captions in displays and exhibitions, but documentation is very different. And currently, the way that the language we use in the v &A is very carefully um, managed in the sense that every phrase, or perhaps if you refer to um, a certain character, if that character isn't already existing in the sort of database, then you have to write about that person. So every single word is very, very carefully chosen. And subjectivity is avoided because we're trying to capture what we understand to be some kind of truth about mm -hmm. objects. And that extends to colours. When I say red, am I seeing the same colour as you're mm -hmm. seeing? Mm -hmm. And so there's a huge endeavour to... to um, treat what we say about objects and what we understand about objects through the lens of our own time in a way that is valuable to future generations, but with a total knowledge that it's always going to be seen through our time. 
so because of that, we record every single change. So if I change a word, one of my colleague Sonnet's labels, uh, um, captions, for, or, or, or um, database entries, then that's recorded. So there's a paper trail going back to the extent that we have kept every single early record. So, for example, a shoe might have come in in sort of 1875, and it just says shoe, Persian. We keep that because it's a record of its time as well. Mm. And I think that it's from that, writing creatively about objects is a beautiful thing. But to my mind, I would feel very, um, very um, adrift if I was simply invited to respond subjectively to something without understanding what it was made from, mm. what its dimensions mm. were, mm. where it came mm. from. Mm. So I think in a way the, the rigour the documentation allows creativity mm. for mm. exhibitions. Mm. So one more question and then it's actually a long question, so <laughs> um, Jeff's observation question about uh, the spatial manifestations of authorship reminded me uh, of an example that Judith uh, cited in one of her curation lectures of um, a wig that Diana Reeland used in her exhibition about um, Marie Antoinette times of this and um, Judith showed it to us. It was this incredible absolutely extravagant oversized wig and apparently the Diana Reeland was never happy with the, uh, with the size of the wig. Originally the wig maker made it to look like the wigs would have looked at the time, and she didn't want it, any of it. She wanted it to be bigger and more exuberant. Uh, and the reason why she wanted it uh, was, sorry, Judith, correct me if I'm wrong, was that this, she wanted to reproduce the effect mm. the wig would have had mm. within the visual culture of that era, rather than the actual dimensions. Um, and this brings me to a question that I think feeds into what Claire was just talking about and also what feeds into what a lot of the slides have been talking about. How important is accuracy, historical accuracy in fashion curation and how does this relate to the authorship? And that's why I said it was a very long question <laughs> because it's a big topic. I mean, my um, feeling is that we'll all disagree on this. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think this is a roll up your sleeves moment. Um, <laughs> shall I go first? <laughs> shall I commit myself? I'm not impressed by accuracy. <laughs> um, because and, and I will qualify this because in some instances of course there is a historical endeavour and that's unequivocal so in part I'm, I'm being intentionally sort of facetious but in part I'm entirely serious in that um, it depends what your project is and I think I agree with Claire that the more the merrier because there are so many perspectives on this subject. And so it depends whether you're talking about dress history or whether you're talking about um, museology. Because one is interpretation in the way that Diana Vreeland saw it in the, in the project that you cited, such that exaggeration stands in for exaggeration. And so if it's not the same you know, distance from the forehead to the head of the wig, that was you know, its 18th century counterpart, then how do, you, how do you communicate this? So you can either communicate it by having an accurate reproduction of the wig and putting in a caption, everyone thought this was really big at the time, even though it doesn't look quite <laughs> as big today, exclamation <laughs> mark. <laughs> or, if, <coughs> if it's me, and not, I'm not speaking in any way for anybody else, one of your options is to make that wig exaggerated. So for exaggeration, you put exaggeration. Now that is not about dress history, it's about interpretation and museology. And I think partly why there's so much sort of, you know, intake of breath in the room is because that these two are misunderstood or intertwined or overlaid or something. And I believe that it is possible 
to live alongside one another in a kind of, well, one is about interpretation and one is about dresses. I'm not a dress historian, so I can speak freely. Um, so it's, that's, that's, I mean, the wig is a really good example of this debate where one thing is classified as something else. If I were to say this is dress history, then an intake of breath would be appropriate. If it's about interpretation, then I think all bets are on. Ultimately, though, I think, because we always laugh and say that we disagree about, you know, do you need the label, don't you need the label? I think I've become, working with Judith, I've become much more open-minded. I do absolutely believe in fact-based history. But ultimately, I think what I really believe in is rigour. And as long as you do what you do with rigour, and it's, and it's been thought through and it's considered, there is room, because I think I don't agree with the fact that there's room for everything because then we get the curated shop windows. But I think that anything un that is undertaken with thought and with rigor, I think absolutely there is a place for it. And also, you know, we're professional human beings. We work to the remit of the institution or the person who's commissioning us. And in certain environments, we can perhaps be much more um, fluid or creative in our interpretation than perhaps, you know, in a small family, orientated museum in a, you know, I think it's horses for courses as well. We have to think about who we're talking to. Mm -hmm. But I think we can always be imaginative in our interpretation, but I think it's as long as we do it with rigour. And I think that's what we really want to get through in our centre, that we're receptive, yeah. we're open-minded, but that rigour is the core that runs through it. Yeah. So I wouldn't do that with a wig. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's about definition. But I like it. <laughs> it's about definition, though, which is why, in a way, why we're here this evening in, and why we're so keen to, to, to have these kinds of conversations is precisely to put ourselves to the test, to not say we're right, mm -hmm. but to say, this is my attitude to it. Mm -hmm. Let's test it. And let's, let's test whether, it, whether anything comes from it, you know, whether we can actually learn something um, from this experiment. I think continuing that conversation, I think also it depends on the audience that you're yeah. speaking to and yeah. the environments in which you're working. As I said in my introduction, I've worked in many varied countries where the um, concept of museum going isn't um, anything like um, the experience that we have here in, in the UK or Europe. And um, for an example um, of an exhibition that I worked on where I commissioned Judith as the exhibition designer was um, uh, an exhibition of jewellery which toured to the Middle East. And this was very experimental jewellery um, for the most part. And so for an audience that might not be familiar with this kind of work where jewellery in, in the context that I was talking about could be made from paper or plastic, um, going to a series of countries where it was very much still in the, the tradition of precious metals. Um, do you design the exhibition in cabinets? So they, it was already within a vernacular that was familiar, that people understood that they were seeing an exhibition um, and that the work inside was to be looked at and explored and investigated. And I think that if that exhibition had been presented here in London and I had commissioned Judith to design the exhibition for, say, someone like the Design Museum, then um, we could have been much more experimental in the approach to the exhibition design mm -hmm. to reflect the work as well. Coming back to Amy and Judith, about what are your curatorial perspectives? And I know one aspect, you've just said that one is into more into interpretation and rigor. Is there anything else that you want to add about what your curatorial well, perspectives think, are? I think it's, it's very easy to become sort of cliched. And yeah. I think this, in a way, is an example of sort of yeah. In terms of defending something that is one of many options, one tends to become a sort of caricature of oneself, yeah. you know. Um, and, and so I think it's kind of what, what my feeling is. It's sort of accurate by whose standards, I feel, because in terms of getting back to the wig, just because it's one example, it's kind of accurate by Diana Vreeland's standards, which the exhibition was about. So it was accurate about inaccuracy. So it was in itself a kind of museological play. So there is an investment um, in ideas that are very precise, because it, it's, it, the, the temptation <coughs> is to think of it as kind of sloppy, is the opposite of accurate, whereas it might be accurate by someone else's standards of de or definition. And I guess in terms of my 
practice and position, it's always been, it's like serving another master that isn't necessarily dress history, even though dress is absolutely my medium. You know, I wouldn't consider anything else. It's sort of, you know, why I get up in the morning <laughs> in that sense, you know, professionally. Uh, you know, that exhibit, thinking of different ways of exhibiting dress is absolutely central. But it's always been about how one might delegate bits of the narrative um, to different parts of the space, getting back to, to Jeff, and how one, in a way, is allowed or, or, or disallowed. Because again, this, this debate raises questions of what are you allowed to do? How much interpretation is distance from the, the integrity of the object? And what is it simply another perspective of standing in another part of the room? Yeah. And I think I've always lived by a sort of hypothetical, what if I stand over there? kind of problem. And I think it's useful, even if it's in disagreement, I think it's useful to this debate in this time kind of thing. But I think so you've that's transformed it. our discipline by that, by your work and your attitude. Um, and also what we say to students often is that you start with space, whereas I always start with an object. I'm always inspired by a thing. And increasingly, I think maybe I'm becoming more and more of a social historian because I love things, but I love things as evidence of people's lives, um, women's lives, primarily. <laughs> um, and so I suppose increasingly I say, well, I tell stories with objects. And it might be a children's book, it might be an exhibition, it might be describing an archive for a publication, but certainly objects, it's objects that thrill me, and it's objects that inspire me, and it's objects that make me want to go and do all sorts of research. Um, so that is my starting point always. But I think then working with Judith, I think, well, I think I might have been much more inflexible about my response. And increasingly, yeah, which is the debates we're having. And also working with our students. I think it, you know, you get different perspectives and all the time we're talking. And, you know, I think one of the debates, one of the big debates I had in my Land Army exhibition was, do you get, um, can the visitors try on the real clothes when I can buy the real clothes really cheaply on eBay? or I can pay five times the price and get someone to make them in calico. And there was this ongoing debate that I really felt, did it really challenge my rigor as a curator to do that? And I think, you know, talking to the students over the years, and only one felt passionately that I absolutely shouldn't do it. So I think, yeah, I think, did, hopefully you inspire your students, but in turn, they certainly inspire you. And in turn, with terms working with Jeff, I think I saw exhibition making practice, again, through a, you know, a very different lens. Um, and it was rigorous, and I was completely impressed. Um, so, yeah, it's about being receptive, isn't it, mm. as well? Can you expand on that, about working with I'm not sure we ever came to a realistic resolution on that, but we did discuss text and exhibitions. Uh, but I think your, your argument, I mean, if you said a bit more about what you think about authorship, is very interesting as, and also I was interested the way you defined yourself always an ex as an exhibition maker, and I think we come back to that terminology again. How is an exhibition maker distinctive from a curator? I think that would be one of my questions to the panel here. I, I sometimes think that if, if curation was in a different institution and funded in a different way, it would probably actually be about six different specialist disciplines. Yeah. And I think in a way, because of how curation is funded and because of where curating is, it's kind of stuck as being one person doing yeah. six, seven, ten specialist jobs mm. and I think I feel a little that that can prohibit curation as a profession developing. Mm. If you look at advertising for instance, my partner works in advertising, there are people working in advertising who do a job that's a twentieth of the professional knowledge and work of curators mm. and it feels that there's not enough, the cura curating hasn't been split into professional activities. But there's a bit of us that wants to do it all. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, do we want the split? <laughs> no, I do agree. I see completely what you're saying. Does anyone else want to comment on that? I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting thinking, you know, we've been talking quite a lot, haven't we, about curating as the formation of an exhibition, and we come back to this exhibition making, and Claire alluded to, you know, a whole other side of it, which is, 
you know, back to the kind of, and I'm sure it came up on here this, with definitions I haven't really been watching, but, you know, it's about someone who cares for something, yeah. isn't it? Which is sort of more mm -hmm. like what we're saying Jane does, and we're calling her an archivist, but could we equally call her a curator? And I think, you know, you're right, Jeff, that I think in, in it's, it's a weird position, isn't it, that in some ways we're, the term is being expanded by that, and I think I side with Amy in that kind of, what I might say is a misuse of the word, you know, an overuse of the word, to, to kind of describe a whole set of things that people have done for a long time that seems to want to um, validate, in a way, something that somebody's doing, and, and somehow calling it curating seems to overvalidate it. And I'm quite curious and interested in the way that curating or curation has become a word that validates doing something that can be editing, and what's wrong yeah. with it being editing. So. Um, I'm trying to think where I was going with that. Um, I think it's we're in an interesting position where we're trying to define and perhaps trying to, to, to create definitions of a subject, but also there is, there is great scope. And I think while curating has gone on for a very long time, it, and, and museology is a, is a long-standing profession and academic subject, in some ways it's also very young. Mm -hmm. And perhaps it's about that way in which we kind of think about what it can be and how it can open up and what the, the strands of it are that, that allows for something more like what you're ask, asking, why don't we have? I, do, I mean, I do agree that the, the, the base role of the curator could be defined very simply, and I always think it's very useful to think about the root of the word in terms of curiosity and the notion of looking after a collection of, of housekeeping. And if you look back at um, how many of the national collections were created, as with yours, they're created from smaller collections, um, from the Eurofopolis collection of ceramics to the Harrods Gift of Shoes. And these collections, which become larger collections, have a kind of organic life. And I think of the curator as a sort of baseline job, is to keep it all together yeah. and occasionally rearrange it. And yet... Yes. As time has gone on in the decades that I've worked in the profession, more and more and more is expected of the curator. Mm -hmm. For a start, you're suddenly visible. You're accountable. You always, you always were accountable, but you're suddenly visible in a way that um, people like me, who would rather um, live in a cupboard, <laughs> are forced to. I guess I guess we're forced to extend our capabilities we have to be good communicators, not just through the written word in academic journals, but we are expected to engage quite rightly. We have to understand scientific developments in conservation and curation. We have to stand, understand the agenda of fundraising. We have to understand the needs of the public are changing. And actually, it just gets more and more complex so you're absolutely right. I mean, I can think of at least a dozen aspects of the curatorial role. And it would be great to divide them out a bit. And I think what's been really helpful for me and my colleagues is the relocation of our collection off-site. Because the collection, which is now at Wise Road, has at last been stored properly. And actually, as with the sort of rigour about documentation, I think that it's liberating. It allows creativity. If you're struggling in a, in, a, in a small room with poor lighting and it's you know, terrible, terrible air that you're breathing, it really doesn't encourage you to stay and think, I'll just go and look in that top cupboard. You think, no, I'll just you know, head back to the office. Whereas the new centre at Blythe Road, I think is immensely liberating in the sense that you can see the objects, the space to appreciate them. And you can understand, if you put this with this, what happens? Before, one the objects were scattered all over the museum. You could never put A with B. Mm. Now we can do that. And there's big tables and there's room to study and to think. So just a simple mechanical enhance, enhancement of storage facilities, which, you know, by the way, cost millions, has actually, I think, changed our lives and the way we, we regard the objects. And yet they're the same objects that we had before. The objects haven't changed. We've changed. That's my... I mean, we used to have a centre like that. Can we join us? No, no, no. <laughs> want our own. <laughs> Sonnet. Don't film. Well, I, just, I wanted to um, agree with what Claire had said just from 
what's been surprising over the last 15 years is how um, widely expanded the role has become. And in addition to the things that Claire mentioned, I think one of the aspects of the, of the role of the curator associated with an institution is the kind of the social work element, as we call it, this kind of the public-facing interaction when you're beholden to an institution and therefore um, have a requirement to respond to inquiries, to visit people's homes, to assess potential donations. And this brings you into um, interactions with people that are often unexpected, both in a positive way and a negative way. Um, and, and there's no training for that. <laughs> I think a psychology course might be in order. Um, and that was something that surprised me um, as I kind of progressed along the path of, of curation, is that so much of the, the, the work is not about um, the exhibition, the book, the project. It's the things that people don't see and uh, mm. that are behind the scenes that have to do with interpersonal skills and um, having a light touch when it comes to the public. Mm. Although we, um, Ben has put together a series of questions and I've come up with some of my own, there's one that I thought was quite interesting that he's put forward here about curatorial commissioning to add to the long list <laughs> that we've already um, which everyone's put together just now from whether it's editing curiosity, social work, inter interaction, public, inter uh, public facing interaction. Um, the subject of curatorial commissioning, what's everyone's thinking on that? What does that mean? Well, in, in, in terms yeah. of the work that I do, it often involves commissioning new work okay. rather than working with existing objects. So um, in terms of the word curator, I wouldn't necessarily um, say that that is an accurate description of what I do. I'm probably more of a commissioner or producer. And um, is commissioning has been something that I started doing at the British Council, and that was became about through site-specific installations or because venues weren't particularly um, appropriate for a particular topic that we were looking at. And it wasn't something that I um, consciously went into, but the more that I commissioned work, the more that I found that it helped me in terms of interpreting and thinking about new stories and new ways of communicating about fashion and dress to a wider audience. And um, for me, fashion is about storytelling about um, a place and a time and particular cultures. And um, so it's something that I'm continuing here in my practice at the London College of Fashion, commissioning new films in response to the Venice Architecture Biennale, bringing the archive to life through the shoe collection. So um, taking archival objects and matching them with um, reinterpretations by contemporary designers so that it can reach a, a, a wider audience who might be interested in contemporary practice, but placing that within a historical um, grounding. So, Whereas I think I 100% want to be commissioned. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're coming to a close, and this is... I don't know why I keep thinking of this. It's probably a difficult question and may, you may not be able to answer, but I've just written a reflective piece on a series of exhibitions I've done in London and uh, Croatia. And the only way I could understand where I was going next was to reflect on those exhibitions. And then the only way I could really get what I was, uh, what, get, uh, what I was to understand what I was doing was to kind of do a spider chart. And that this, uh, that, uh, I have at the center the title of the exhibition and the archive that um, the exhibition was drawn, was built on. And then from that, all the new themes that had come out of that. So, based on all the things we said today, and there's, I mean, I could go through some of, them, some of the points. What is the discipline? It's some people, it's sometimes it's defensive, but what is at the center? We've got this idea of the different um, approaches or the different um, aspects of what a curator is. Alison's just brought up something new in using the term commissioner or producer. Um, there's that idea of you know whether we're talking about interpretation or um, dress history and, or rigor, um, whether it's a, the caption is about Oh, the lovely thing about description um, from, through the lens of our time, which Claire 
mentioned, but there's also the, the documentation, the caption of documentation. So with all of that, um, what, for each one of you, is at the centre of curation for you, based on all of those things going on? Is that too difficult a question? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Mine's a passion for objects. Okay. Do you do? Certain objects. <laughs> Certain objects such as? That appeal to me. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Are we, are we all being asked? Yeah, so each know. one, please. Okay. Sorry. Who's that, Judith? I'm not sure. Um, I think it's something about staging those objects in a way that might be meaningful to somebody who happens upon them. You know, that they might think differently about that object or be inspired about something about that object. And, um, yes, I'm sure it's about sort of inspiration, ideally, you know, that somebody will, will sort of have a thought about this object that, that, that we place. And it's something about, um, the bodies in there somewhere, mm -hmm. in that we, we, we're all grappling and something we haven't really talked about mm -hmm. tonight is this surrogate body, um, which Naomi Filmer's here this evening and she and I have had more conversations about, you know, surrogate bodies than I, you know, <laughs> care to list, but it's sort of, it's also about that, about this identification and how you manage the anachronism of looking at an object. Mm -hmm. That is, that is often not of our time. And so I think it's tied up with, with managing that distance, the sort of gulf between the visitor and this object that we identify with so intuitively, but that is not our, you know, that is, uh, is also so sort of other. Okay, lovely. Um, I think for me it's about, curation is about storytelling, and so it's about, um, finding a medium in which to communicate that story, whether that's using existing objects or commissioning new objects or commissioning a film. Um, I suppose for me, it, it, it's back to the object or, or the objects. It's, it's um, enabling you to be there, to be looked after, to be collected, to be uh, preserved, and then facilitating access and making them visible. So that, to me, is, is my fundamental purpose. <laughs> mm. Sure. Something of what everybody said. It's <laughs> <laughs> difficult, you know, that's a cop-out <laughs> quest, <laughs> cop <-out> quest <laughs> answer, isn't it? But, you know, the, I, th I, I don't think it's one, uh, you know, as, as my mind was kind of toing and froing about what I was going to say there, and I think, you know, there is, an I there is that idea of the actual thing, the object. There is that idea of the story. There's that idea of the preservation. Um, as we were talking about um, commissioning, I was thinking, you know, for me, curating was always about collaboration. Mm. That was the kind of key thing for me. It, it, it's mm. not the pleasure of curation, and maybe this is an answer to the question in a way and not really what you're asking me, but, you know, it was always about the people, you know, the people that you met and the people that you got to do with, whether that was somebody you were commissioning or somebody that was fulfilling a particular role in that project. And, and the sort of the, in some ways, the flexibilities of what those terms and titles might mean. One of the things that we tried to do in the contemporary program, the VA was very much about exploring, in some ways, what the curator was. So, you know, I, I acted as both a curator and a project manager. Mm -hmm. And very often, that line, you know, Judith and I worked together on um, Piaggi, where I was the project manager. But sometimes those lines were blurred, weren't they? Mm -hmm. And it was that was what was exciting. And I think there's a sort of an excitement about what curating can do and allow you to do in working with a whole set of people, alive or dead. Um, you know, because sometimes those people you're collaborating with are the dead people that were engaged or involved with the object. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's really answered the question, Carol, but you no, know, the thought. <laughs> Claire? Um, I remember in my first week at university years ago, um, where I studied English, 
the tutor said to me, why are you here? And I went, I don't know. Um, but about half an hour later, I stumbled across something in a book by the um, philosopher Nelson Goodman, where he said, the drive is curiosity, but the aim is enlightenment. And I've hung on to that ever since, because to me, that is the absolute driver in what I do, whether it's curation or any of the other things that fascinate me about life. But it is, the drive is definitely curiosity. And sometimes it's solitary and sometimes it's shared. And it's brilliant working with colleagues like you, Sean, I just want to say that, and all of you. So I feel that sometimes it's a solitary curiosity or it's a mass <coughs> curiosity. And I think to say that the aim is enlightenment is slightly, um, it's quite dramatic. Perhaps I would change that word slightly to say revelation. Because actually, through everything we contain in our museums and our homes, or the thoughts we contain, or the books we read, they enrich our lives and make them far more multi-layered. And although we can agree to disagree about what we do, I think you're right, there's always room for different interpretations and different understandings of our profession. But without passion, you're, you're lost. So, mm. curiosity and passion. Mm. Right, I just want to <coughs> thank the whole panel, which was a fantastic evening. And I think what's come across for me uh, about curating, because so much has been discussed and explored and shared and um, confessed, um, is that curating is a space to think, to explore, be curious, to <coughs> rearrange, and there's a revelation, and of course about passion. Thank you all.